it was hard to be happy, but you got to change your thoughts. You'll change your life, change your words. You speak, change your life. I was brutalized as an infant and as up to five years old, uh, brutal child abuse. Ray, I didn't grow up on love. I grew up on survival. That's totally different. I never got adopted because they said the, the, the government said I was unadoptable because of my behavioral and emotional problems. You know where I'm from, California, 72% of the male prison inmates have been in foster care. Wow. In Texas, the, one of the biggest states in America, Texas, 80% of the Texas death row inmates have been in foster care. 65% of the sex trafficking in America from young boys and girls in foster care. Over 50% of the U.S. homeless population has been in foster care. So, Ray, statistics show that I should be dead, incarcerated, an addict, addicted to substances or alcohol, suicidal. But I'm none of those. Because grit, greatness requires intense tenacity. I started working on it. I came up with that. I have got to tap into my tenacity button. My, my tenacity muscle, right? My tenacity. I will never give up. I will never give up. Honestly, I feel like I'm so lucky. I feel like I'm just having a, like a free one-on-one -on -one with a motivational speaker. That's like the best. <laughs>
and then was able to find a foster home that kept me long term. I never got adopted because they said the, the, the government said I was unadoptable because of my behavioral and emotional problems. But uh, I found a foster home or a, a social worker, caseworker found a foster home for me and I was able to stay there long term. And they were both educators. They were both teachers. And what are teachers supposed to do? Teach. Look for the potential in a child, look sure. for their greatness, right? Keep mm -hmm. planting seeds, speak yep. faith into that kid, not to feed into that kid, right? And so they were both teachers and they worked with me and worked with me. And I learned to read and write at about nine years old, roughly. Wow. Uh, I learned to run at about seven years old. I learned to I'm walk sure. up and down wow. stairs about six, seven years old. My vocabulary at six years old was 75 words. The national average in America is 2,600 words for a six-year-old. Wow. A three-year-old in America is 300 word vocabulary an average of. And so I had a lot of, a lot of issues, a lot of learning disabilities, but here's the key. The greatest investment in this life is your children. And so nobody had ever invested in me until these two teachers came into my life and started not to believe the labels that were given to me, but believe in my potential to never limit the potential of me. And then I rose. Oh, so these two teachers must have had a really profound impact on your life. Yes. Oh, that's incredible. So what was it like for you at, at this age, you know, going from being neglected constantly to finding these two teachers who are showing you kind of care and affection and actually finding that potential in you? Because see that, like, as you said, that potential in you, obviously it's flourished now, but it, like after going through so much hardship at a young age, it must have been deep rooted in you in the sense that it wasn't on the surface. Like these people, they really had to probably you know uh pull that out of you in some way to actually find where that is find what uh, your potential is and kind of uh you know water it and allow it to manifest so what was that like for you at being such a young age it was like pulling off layers of an onion right uh -huh. and you're pulling off the layers trying to get to the deeper part of the onion and you're uh -huh. crying you're going through emotion when you deal with onions right you're going through all this stuff i can't do this anymore and they wanted to give up but they kept peeling off the layers and they realized somewhere inside of me was a happy boy but i was an angry boy and angry rightfully so because of the abuse the rejection the abandonment gotcha. that i got that i've gone through and i did not trust anybody so even though i was in a loving environment I didn't understand what love was. Mm -hmm. I thought love was you abuse me. I didn't understand the care, the compassion, the empathy. And so uh, it was. It took a long time for me to build trust. It took years, but to see if they would never give up on me, right? Yep. And so they would pull back these layers of this onion or this banana or whatever you want to call it. They pull them back and they would try to get deep, you know, get the deep root, uh, go deeper inside. And what they realized was I was a smart kid, that I was a sponge. It's just that nobody had ever invested in me. And then they put me on a musical instrument at 10 years old, the clarinet. And I learned to play this clarinet and I became like this prodigy clarinet player at 12 years old, wow. uh, competing against you know United States universities and colleges against wow. college students and winning against college students at 12, 13 wow. years old. Wow. because I had memorized eight, ten, eight to 10 page concertos. Wow. And so they worked with me two hours a day on music, private lessons, band lessons, symphonic lessons. And you know, music uses a different part of the brain with the creativity mm -hmm. and you can find some great smartness in there, you know? <laughs> and so I, I was able to build my self-esteem, yet they were always planting inside of me seeds of love, seeds of hope, seeds of courage, seeds of integrity, Seeds of empathy, seeds of compassion, seeds of persistence, perseverance, yep. determination. And those seeds never took root until, Ray, I started to like myself. I started to love myself because that is the nutrient. That's, that's how you nurture those seeds. The water around the seed, right, is to love yourself, to like yourself. And when I started to do that as a teenager, I started to really, really blossom. It, you're saying as you started to like yourself now uh, as a teenager, right? And 
I, like it, it's hard for me to even you know you know thankfully I, I've had a really good uh, upbringing certainly I think most people have comparatively to what you faced but see having been rejected from your parents and from so many people was it really hard like you know because the people that are supposed to love you they, they didn't give you that love so for you to be able to love yourself what was that like and was, yeah. was it a particular turning point or was that a really hard thing to do it was really hard because I figured if my own parents got rid of me, I wasn't worthy of love. I was worthy of shame, of blame and guilt, right? The, the bad kid got thrown away. The good kids got to stay with mom. So my mom had three kids from three different men. So And so it was a tough situation. And I didn't really learn to love myself until about 18 years old. After my brother was killed, my sister was shot and killed, and my good friend was killed. Um, You're it really broke me down. You know, I was all within 16 to 17 years old. I lost three people and it broke me down. And I kind of, I went through a lot of therapy, Ray, a lot of counseling, you know, twice a week uh, as a kid. And then as a teenager, uh, once in a while, but for several years, I went to tw twice a week from ages six to almost 13 years old and nothing was helping me. But nobody ever told me this. And I'm going to tell you this. I grew up in a church where you are to forgive others. Mm -hmm. So you forgive others. You turn the other cheek. But no one ever told me this, Ray, to forgive yourself. No one told me. It was always forgive others. But a lot of us go through life holding the shame, this blame, this bitterness, this resentment. And they hold it and it weighs us down throughout our life. And sometimes it makes our life so bitter and we're so resentful and we hold these grudges and we have all this hate. And, but nobody told me to get rid of it. Nobody told me to forgive myself for my mistakes, to, to forgive my mom, to just let it go and grow, to be better and not bitter, to not let the inner me become the enemy. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Once I started learning that, man, I could take responsibility for the direction of my life and go in the direction that I want, not the direction like my parents to confine me or define me. I was letting my parents' mistakes do all that. That was imprisoning me. I decided to let all their mistakes refine me so that I could be free. Incredible. Incredible. So uh, something I want to pick on quickly is that you said um, these teachers you had, they kept planting seeds of empathy and planting seed. See that the, these planting these positive seeds. And what form was that? Was that through affirmations or was because I know a lot of people and I think see affirmations, whether it's negative affirmations, people tell themselves. I could never have a girl like that. I could never be rich. I could never have a job like that. Oh, see that happiness that they've, these guys have got on Instagram. I could never have. It. So, you know, those are affirmations. They're affirming a negative belief about themselves. Right. But on the other hand, we can uh, make affirmations which are positive. I'm confident. I am outgoing. And we start to believe these things. So, in, um, <coughs> excuse me. In what form did you did these uh, affirmations come to you? And how did you exercise them to the point that over wrote the conditioning that had been uh, kind of embedded in you for so many years prior? Yeah, so it wasn't like affirmations. It was like, we love you, Derek. You have to love yourself, love yourself. Derek, you're courageous. Derek, you are funny. Derek, you're going to have a great life. The, your better days are ahead of you. You know, stuff like that, that would um, speak faith into me. Sure. And uh, the key was loving me. You know, if they loved me, which I didn't believe I was worthy of love, but once I started to believe it years later, I had this deep gratitude and this appreciation to uh, to them, but to myself that I look when I look back, I had survived all these things, and that gives you a great deal of um, pride, not in an egotistical way, just as a holy cow, I've made it, I did it. I've done it. Nobody could destroy me. Not my mom couldn't destroy me. My stepdad couldn't destroy me. My dad couldn't destroy me. All the people in my life that were against me couldn't destroy me. The only one destroying me, Ray, was me. <laughs> so that's why I had to learn, don't let the inner me become the enemy. 
but I had my foster parents who were teachers and other people in my corner telling me how great I am, that I have so much potential that don't sell yourself out, Derek. You're better than this, Derek. You're better than this. Every time I would act out, right? Mm -hmm. And then say that you have something great waiting for you. You have to just grab it, Derek. You have to believe. You have to visualize to materialize instead of thinking of all the, the bad things that I was a loser, 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 that I'm a winner, winner, winner. And to this day, sometimes I have to fight that I'm not a loser that I'm a loser, right? And I have to fight that. Like sometimes my brain comes in, it creeps in my brain that I'm a loser. And I'm like, a, no, I'm not. But then sometimes I give it, well, I might be a loser for an hour, you know? Oh, okay. You know, sometimes you beat yourself up because that's the way I was conditioned in life. And it's hard to break those habits. But when you break those habits, you can make the rest of your life the best of your life. You can become better yep. and not bitter, right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, see so many people, I think they don't realize the um, how powerful their own words are. And when they start believing these negative things about themselves, when they start believing that, you know, you know, you're only worthy of shame or that your life isn't happy or that I'm never going to have this or I'm never going to have that. They, or they don't realize the actual tangible effect that has. Now, I actually saw this recently. It was a picture, right? And it was two scans of uh, the brain there's the scan of a person's brain who's depressed and there's a scan of uh, the kind of uh, uh, so to speak a normal person's brain a non-depressed person's brain and you could actually see that like the lighting in the brain was different and we can actually see if you tell someone to think of a word like parts of the brain light up and you know when you practice happiness you're starting to develop these kind of neural pathways uh, which strengthen and you know they say you should practice gratitude because the more you practice it the better you become at it. Whereas if you practice anger or sadness, the more you practice it, the better you become. So to speak, see when we have a thought, I think people underestimate how powerful those thoughts are because not only is it having a psycho psychological impact, it's actually having a physical, tangible uh, effect on your brain. And I think so many people are unaware of this and just to the extent that the things that you tell yourself, how true they actually turn out to be. Right. Uh, your brain is very powerful. Your words are very powerful. How you speak, right, can call into existence what you're thinking. So if you're always thinking negative, what do you think you're attracting into your life? If you're always thinking everything's a blessing, you'll probably attract more positivity in your life. Uh, what you focus on grows. Sure. That's the truth. Yeah. If you if you water a seed, it grows. Yeah. But you have to make sure that the seed is planted at the right depth. If you bury that seed six feet and you buried it in anger and grudge and resentment for years, it's, it's going to be tougher and tougher for that seed to see the light. So sometimes you got to go in and, and uh, dig around that seed and bring it up to the right depth so it can sprout. A seed won't Amazing. sprout when it's buried six feet. Sure, man. <laughs> so um, you're, you're 12 years old and you, you've gotten these teachers and they're starting to teach you to love yourself. You've uh, been introduced with your fascination of music, which is obviously manifested as you have a beautiful collection of instruments behind you. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, awesome. So, you know, you, you've had that. Things are looking up. You're competing against college kids. But then you said 17, 16, 17, 18 years old, you suffered three losses of uh, really prominent people in your life. So what was the next step in, in your life after that? Yeah, so I was in a lot of trouble at that age. Uh, obviously, more rejection, more abandonment, more uh, anger, mm -hmm. anger at everything. And so um, I did really bad in school, mm -hmm. in high school, and got kicked out. And I ran away and all these things that a kid in foster care sometimes does because we don't know how to deal with our emotions. See, I might be 18 years old, but emotionally, because of the trauma that I've gone through as a kid, I might be emotionally like 12 years old or 14 years old. I'm not at the age level. And so um, I went through a three-day course at 18 years old and how to understand my anger and my rage and my disappointment in life and how to forgive. And I did it for three days, all day, the special course. Um, and it was amazing. It changed my life. Really? Uh, because I was able to shift the blame. See, I blamed myself for many years that I was the one that broke up my family. And I remember the counselor saying, Derek, you're 18. Mm -hmm. What you do with your life is your fault now. 
Are you going to let zero to 18? If your life is like this, zero to 100, are you going to let zero to 18 control the next 80 years of your life? This much of your life control the, this part of your life. And she said something very, very important to me that changed my life. She said, Derek, it was never your fault. It was your parents out of control. It wasn't you. It was your parents out of control. But now everything is on you now. Are you going to let this be an excuse? And so I decided right then that I wasn't going to let my past infect my future. That I wasn't going to let my parents' weaknesses destroy my greatness. That I was going to take responsibility for the direction of my life. But it took a while. But I started the path. Once you start changing your thoughts, you change your life. Once you start changing your habits, your daily rituals, your patterns, you start changing your life. I call it the one degreeer. If, you, if you're driving your car and you just turn your steering wheel a one degree like this, just one degree out of 360, right? Your car will eventually go that direction. It might be further down the road but it will eventually go left if you turn it one degree left. Then as you get more and more confident with your choices and your patterns and your thoughts and your words, you start turning it three degrees or four mm -hmm. degrees. Yep. And then your life goes in the direction that you want it to go. It may not be a go as quick, but you got to keep working on yourself. And once I started Amazing. to work on myself, Ray, my life went in the direction I wanted it to go. You see that analogy about the car? I'm, I'm going to use that and tell that to other people. That was beautiful. Oh, really yeah. like that analogy. And because um, there's another important lesson there, and that's that, see, your life, it's not static. No matter what you do, your life is still moving forward. There's right. no stopping time. Like, regardless of what you do, life is still going forward. But see, every time you incorporate uh, a good habit, whether it's spiritually working on yourself, mentally, your knowledge, learning things, positive affirmations, looking at uh, changing your diet, eating well, you're going one more degree in the right direction. Right. And that's just how important to create these habits were. So uh, see for yourself, once you went to this uh, course, what, obviously you started adopting responsibility. That was, it seems like a big thing you learned to adopt responsibility. So what did the, the next stage look like after that? Yeah, so I wanted, well, let me go back to the car. When you're driving the car one degree, you have to make sure you're looking through the windshield, not through the rear mirror, mm. because your life isn't going backwards. You're not in reverse. You've got to keep looking forward. You've got to keep thinking that life is going to get better. That's the key. So um, after I went to that three-day course, I, I got reinstated back in high school, and I was able to graduate high school. I'm the first one in my family to graduate school. My mom, they dropped out in ninth grade at 14 and my dad didn't even go. So I am the first one to break the cycle, which then gave me confidence to work on the next thing. Go to some college, go to college, uh, you know, get a good job, um, start my own business, you know, and then my life just started going in a good direction. Everything that I started touching started working in my favor, every goal, because I learned the simple method of a map, a massive action plan. I heard that from Tony Robbins years and years ago. Have a map, a massive action plan, set goals. I didn't set goals. I didn't know what goals were, you know, short term, month, you know, six month, one year, five year, 10 year goals. I started to set goals. And when you, when you visualize, you materialize what you focus on grows, right? So I started to focus on these things. And then like everything was magnetized to me. And I learned to call the destination first. Where do I want to be? So I wanted to be in real estate at that time. So I found the destination I wanted to go to. That's the key. Find what you where you want to go to because there will always be clues or a blueprint to the success. I don't care what it is. There's always a blueprint to that success, to that destination. There's always a map. Always. And somebody's done it before you most of the time. So I started working on my map my massive action plan, and then nobody could stop me. <laughs> Amazing. So um, you, you made the uh, go for real estate. Is that where you went next? See, at this point, it is where things starting to look up for you. Was it more of a, a had you managed to put all of that stuff behind you? Or did, did you still feel yourself being weighed down by it at all? Oh, yeah. You always will have the little, uh, uh, the dark cloud over you. 
Oh, you're not good enough. Oh, you're, you're, you know, you don't speak well enough or da, da, da. all these things are going to pull at you and you have to tell your brain to shut up. Mm-hmm. Bad thoughts out, good thoughts in. You're only one thought away from another thought. So you have to control your thought. You have to witness your thought. Your subconscious is so deeply ingrained with all the negative beliefs that it's telling your conscious that you're nothing. And you have to tell your subconscious to shut up. (laughs) And it's the power of being in the now. That great book by Eckhart Tolle was to witness your thoughts. Think about what you're thinking about. And so I learned to just swipe my thoughts out like a phone, right? You swipe your pictures on your phone or whatever. And so I learned to get that thought out as quick as possible because a lot of people live in their negative thoughts for years. They just unpack and live there. And I didn't want to do that. But to this day, I still get negative thoughts that I have to fight out. Mm -hmm. Nobody is bulletproof from those. Everybody I know that's successful still has negative thoughts. And you have to just maybe fill them for a second, a minute and move on. Just get them, get them out. Don't unpack and live there. But before I became, I went into real estate uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, I was a a delivery driver. I worked at an old convalescent home. There were a couple of jobs that gave me confidence to go to the next level. Everything was a stepping stone. Sometimes two steps forward, one step, one step back or three steps back, two steps forward. Then <clears throat> one step forward, you know, half step back, it would just go. But if it, you look it at my just life like, like that, yeah. Yeah. If you look at my life, like a chart or a, like a, <clears throat> like a stock graph or something you'll see it's just like this it's a sure. slow it's not like this sure oh crap i made a bad mistake it sets me back two steps now i gotta fight for my life again and then just okay three steps forward and then da, 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 and it's just like this step <clears throat> do you want to go get a glass of water yeah get, get a glass yeah, of water sorry about that <laughs> no no it's cool it's cool so um <laughs> see see one thing about the way you speak the way you speak is powerful. And uh, one thing I recognize about the way you speak is you actually speak from really uh, low in your gut. And like to do that, you need to breathe deep. And this is something that people usually learn. And uh, one of my mentors, Elliot Hulls, talks about these neurotic holding patterns as we get stressed and tense. Uh, we actually forget how to breathe and the breathing becomes very shallow. And you can yeah. actually hear how kind of tight and rigid someone is from the breath. Um, so see the, so obviously you have a a deep breath and you you know you just told me which shocked me that you're six foot six you're a big guy <laughs> you know so but see that uh, that like tightness did you ever practice uh, breathing exercises or meditation yes. and stuff like that uh well so, just i'm a a singer rapper right and stuff so i i do see, a I lot of the diaphragm exercises sure. yeah a lot of diaphragm so that my voice doesn't get sore after like doing six hour event eight hour event you know i'm not hoarse Cause it's all coming from this diaphragm. Sure. So yeah, hold on one second. I got <laughs> from coughing. I, honestly, I, got... I feel like I'm so lucky. I feel like I'm just having a like a free one-on-one with a motivational speaker. It's like the best. <laughs> okay. So yeah, yeah, sometimes I'll get on a roll and I will just go. You know. Yeah. So I, I actually forget that I'm present in this and this is interactive. I feel like I'm watching a YouTube video and then you stop talking and I'm like, oh wait, I need to say something. <laughs> I was just enjoying listening to it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, man. Yeah, so my life started to really transform uh, from job to job, getting more and more confident. And then I got into real estate at about 23, 24 years old, right in there. How about the rapping? Yeah, you, you mentioned the rapping. When, when did that come in? Yeah, so I, I started rapping when I was about 16 years old. I went to a school in the San Francisco Bay Area that's very culturally mixed. And I was going through a hard time. And one of my friends told me, what do you think about rap, man? Just get the pain out, get the pain out. And I started working on rap and I, I sucked at rap, man. I, I didn't know rhythm on that. I didn't know how to do syllable arrangement. I didn't know syncopation. I didn't know how to flow, word rhyming, all that stuff. And then I started working on it. And I started realizing that I had a gift from the clarinet. Anybody who knows that's played clarinet or sax or oboe knows about the tongue hitting the reed, the staccatos. You know, it's the tongue hitting the reed and my tongue moved quick. 
And then my friend gave me some reggae, like a reggae mixtape back in those days. And I started listening to Lucky Dube, Peter Tosh, Yellow Man, Bob and Ziggy Marley. And I started vibing out to reggae. And I realized I had this gift with like tongue twisting. And so in some of my battles, I do something like, well, I'll be the ripping. I'm thinking of making, taking my time. I'll be the ripping. I'm thinking of making, it's not going to make it, kicking it with the rhyme. And then I'll switch a rig it. Is a man that wants to feel, they're going to make it, it's not going to make it, kicking it, kicking it with the deal. Somebody about to feel like coming, nothing is impossible. <laughs> and then everything changed. You're like, oh my gosh, this guy is good. Cause I don't look like a rapper. I don't, <laughs> you know, I'm not a gangster. I, you know, I don't got tats uh -huh. all over my face. I'm pretty clean cut. I, you know, all that stuff. But I, it was a, it was therapy for me, really. It was the taxi to my spirit. It was the rap was the master key to the lock of the prison door of my self imprisonment. It allowed me to have a voice to get the creative creativity out, the bad stuff out and just write it out. And then everything changed. And then I was like, wow, I'm getting good at rap. And then people were saying, you're getting really good. So then uh, everything started taking off at 16, 17, 18. And then I was doing music and I was rapping, but then I was shelved in the, in the 1990s. And there was this uh, guy named Vanilla Ice. I don't know if he ever came yeah, to yeah, Scotland. Yeah, yeah so, uh, <laughs> yeah, he gave kind of a bad reputation and everything uh, shut down and then went to Boys to Men, TLC and all these other groups. So I kept rapping in the 90s and then Eminem came out in like late 90s, early 2000s. And I'm like, man, that's me. That's like my story. Uh -huh. And he took off and I didn't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I mean, it's interesting. You know, my rapping dad videos have had like close to 300 million views. And it's just me rapping in the car, the kids, rapping in the car with the kids. Mm -hmm. And I just have a good time. You can look up rapping dad videos on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube. You can just look under Rapping Dad. You'll see it. R A P P I N G. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe that's how I found you, the Rapping Dad videos. But I don't know if I saw your motivational speech first or if I saw your Rapping Dad uh, yeah. videos first, which were massive. And obviously, yeah. looking at you, you're not like when you start rapping reggae style. Yeah. It was so <laughs> like unexpected. It's amazing. But um, would you say that uh, helped you with the, the motivational speaker stuff? It helped kind of get your message out there and help bring more uh, attention to you. Yes, that was like the cherry on top. I had already doing, been doing motivational speaking for quite a while, and that just opened up another door. And then I was on Steve Harvey's TV show yeah, I saw uh, in America, I saw and uh, he called me the rapping dad. Before then, I was called the cool dad on all these platforms. Uh, okay. And then he called me the rapping dad, and uh, it was kind of crazy. Shaquille O'Neal, the basketball legend, he called me MC Soccer Dad, <laughs> which is kind of funny, right? Uh, and then Tosh.0 called me the cool dad. And uh -huh. that's a great, that's a big comedian, Tosh.0 and so in America. And so uh, it just kind of traveled. And when I was on Steve Harvey TV show, then Rap and Dad just became the brand. Sure, so. man. See for you to like Shaquille O'Neal's recognizing your story and uh, Tosh and, um, uh, you know, S Steve Harvey. What was that like going from like, like you changed your life so dramatically when when was it you realized that hold on uh like i'm in control of where the ship is going just by changing some things incorporating these good habits what was like that turning point because it, it must have been like a really powerful uh, realization yeah it was kind of crazy being uh recognized at taco bell or mcdonald's or in the airport mm -hmm. um and then snoop dog shared my video and then <laughs> Uh, T-Pain, T.I., and a bunch of other rappers started sharing my videos. And it was surreal because these are people that I'm like, holy cow, these are big time, right? Yeah, sure. But what it did was it gave me a platform to talk about my life story. Mm -hmm. And I go into these inner cities. I go into prisons. I go into juvenile youth detention centers. And I don't see a lot of these rappers doing that. They're just on on the, the stage, I actually go into the trenches and try to help change people's lives, transformation. So I think it was kind of good that I didn't make it as a rapper on main on the main stage that I was able to make it the way that I made it by sharing a story, by being a motivational speaker, and then using rap as a creative tool to get into the trenches with people. Sure. 
Uh, well, here's a question for you. So you spoke on, you know, Eminem took off, but you didn't. But see, Eminem's message is very different from your message. Yeah. Your message is uh, trying to uplift people. Whereas Eminem, like, I, I don't really listen to rap, but I, I remember he made, uh, there's a controversy about him in which he released a song that says, I don't know what the song was called, but the kind of message of it was, I'm not a role model. I'm just, you know, rapping about my terrible life. But like these people, they never really tried to be role models. And people right. who did take such people's role models, they, you know, because you see people trying to imitate that rapping lifestyle now. And that rapping gangster lifestyle is drugs and it's women and it's cars and it's materialism. And a lot of things that are going to lead to you not being happy if you really chase those things. Uh, would you say that, <clears throat> excuse me, would you say it was potentially your message uh, that because it was a positive, do you think that at all inhibited, inhibited your progress into the mainstream as a rapper? Yeah, you know, Eminem had a, has a message that a lot of people <laughs> in America can resonate with because there are a lot of brokenness in humans. And so Eminem was able on a lot of his songs to bring this brokenness of people together so, you know, I liked Eminem. I, 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 there's a, a good part, you know, I mean, he's obviously much older now and stuff and he's grow, he's grown a lot. Um, but the thing is, is my story, I needed another creative way. I didn't want to be another Eminem or another Vanilla Ice or whatever it was going to be, right? Yeah. So I think it was just meant to be that I was going to be a motivational speaker first and then use hip hop, which what is hip hop all about? It's, it's like, the struggles, not not rap these days, but rap in the old days, we call it old school. It was about the struggles of your life. And you did see, you did see Eminem rap a lot about his struggles mm -hmm. uh, in his early on rapping career. And so a lot of people resonated that and a lot of people resonate and vibe with mine because, you know, death, abandonment, rejection, fatherless, motherless, like all this stuff that I've gone through. People resonate with that. The difference between him and I is that um, I paint myself as a victor, that I made it, and I'm I'm now helping people. I, I'm not a hate dealer. I'm not a dream dealer. I'm a hope dealer. And that's what I really go after. I, I did a TED Talk. You can look it up uh, called The Power of Determination, not about your IQ, about your I will. And in there, I gave a TED Talk on the power of hope basically and i came up with an acronym of hope helping one person every day hope helping other people excel hope so i'm more of a hope dealer yeah. uh, not a hate dealer i don't peddle hate i don't sell hate um i'm i love everyone i want everyone to succeed but everybody's got a struggle and everybody's not where i am in the season of my life yet right yeah. So I can't compare myself to Eminem or to other people because everybody's in their own season of healing, of their own season of growth, or maybe they aren't healing yet. So sure. I hope to plant the seed of hope by being how, a hope dealer. How, how did you get into uh, uh, hope dealing, motivational speaking? Because it's just such an incredible turnaround from someone that was dished such a hard life to being someone who's distributing hope. Like, um, so how, how did the whole motivational speaking thing, how did that start? Is that like your, your main time thing? Like, cause oh, I mean, yeah, that's, what I for, that's how I make money. That's how yeah, I live. Sure. Yeah. Cause I, you so, have your website, your website's I will never give up. So yes, how did, how did that all, how, how did that all start? Yeah. So the website's I will never give up.com. So what's interesting is I went into real estate and mortgage home loans and I had a couple businesses that did very well, multi-million dollar company. And, um, I did very well. Mm -hmm. And then 2008 came in America, the greatest recession we'd ever seen. And I lost my businesses. I almost lost my home. I, I went from being like this to free falling. So you saw my life as a graph like this and it went like this. I'm at a high and then all of a sudden, yeah. bam. And I had to learn to deal with a lot of stuff. It was another growth moment at my life at 38 years old at that point. So I decided to write a book about my life. I got a copy of my foster care records and I was really in a dark place because I thought I had built up something that would last forever. Mm -hmm. And I am now unemployed. Don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I wrote this book called I Will Never Give Up About My Life. Mm -hmm. And I made it personal, not just never give up, 
I wanted to make it personal so that people would repeat it and internalize it like I will never give up. I will never give up. And so it's easy to just say the cliche, oh, never give up, Ray. No, repeat after me. I will never give up, right? And so I made it personal. And that, that book started taking off a little. And then people wanted me to talk about my story. I had never really talked about I was from foster care. That's not something I would want to, to, to dwell on. But I realized, holy cow, I really have come far. And I started going through some more therapy again and learning how to deal with some of the stuff that came during that dark period in my life again, 38 years old, basically starting all over again. And I went through therapy and all these things. And I realized I hadn't dealt with everything. And sometimes it takes decades to deal with everything. And then I decided to be vulnerable. People said, oh my gosh, you reinvented yourself, Derek. Like Ray, you reinvented yourself. And I said, no, I just became my authentic self. And I realized that what I thought was a curse in my life became one of my greatest blessings. It's amazing I went through foster care and survived. Do you know where I'm from, California? 72% of the male prison inmates have been in foster care. Wow. In Texas, the, one of the biggest states in America, Texas, 80% of the Texas death row inmates have been in foster care. 65% of the sex trafficking in America from young boys and girls in foster care. Over 50% of the U.S. homeless population has been in foster care. So, Ray, statistics show that I should be dead, incarcerated, an addict, addicted to substances or alcohol, suicidal. But I'm none of those. Because grit, greatness requires intense tenacity. I started working on it. I came up with that. I have got to tap into my tenacity button. My, my tenacity muscle, right? My tenacity. And then once I started doing that again at 38, 39, 40 years old, my life transformed again. And then during the greatest recession of America, I started to rise big time being a motivational speaker because there were so much broken people. There were so many broken people in America. Friends, my friends committed suicide because they lost their job. All these people unemployed, people losing their homes, their cars, everything. And then I was able to be that hope dealer. It changed my life. You are so inspiring. You've got so much power in your voice. Uh, honestly, man, I've, I've really enjoyed this so much. Thank you. Yeah, man. I, I just want to ask you a couple of roundoff questions. Um, so first, you've mentioned a couple of books. You mentioned uh, The Power of Now, as well as a couple others. What are some of your favorite books? Well, I would say my favorite book. Oh. The Power of Now Power by of Eckhart Tolle. A great, great book about living in the moment, not living in your past, not living in your future. All you have is this second. Um, I, I would say that's my favorite book. And then awesome. obviously, um, you know, I love uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer, The Power of Intention. That's a great book, The Power of oh, Intention. Okay. I don't have that one. Yeah, I love that book. Uh, Speaking of and the power of now, like Dale Carnegie, Tony Robbins, yes, yes. Boy, you know, Tim Ferriss, like there's so many, I got a whole library over here, but uh, I have a bunch of uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer books and right, he has, okay. he's had a very similar life to me. He was in foster care. He never knew his dad. His dad was, in, you know, like all these things. So I really resonated with uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer. In fact, when I was in this motivational magazine a few years ago, they called me the young Dr. Wayne Dyer. And I'm like, I love that quote that he says, you know, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Oh, so that's, so him I, said that, I know that quote, way, but yeah. I don't know it's him. That's amazing. Oh, okay. Yeah. But um, if I change the way I look at my life, my life will change. So I used to think of my life as a curse, but now my life is a blessing. How do you think my life amazing. is now? Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. 
A great answer. Uh, another question for you is what is a piece of advice you've been given that you never forgot? Okay. Wickedness never was happiness. <laughs> Wickedness never leads to happiness. Evil, doing bad, making bad choices never leads to happiness. Amazing. Uh, and where did you hear that from? I think it was my foster mom. Oh, really? It always stuck with me. Yeah. That's amazing. That's yeah, amazing. It's very simple, right? Um, well, we can't leave this without me doing some kind of motivational rap. Oh, please, please. <laughs> okay, so we'll end on this. Um, so you can find me on all social media under Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube under all, Rapping Dad. All, all of your links are, are in the bio. All of okay, your links, wonderful. I'll put them all there. Yes, so we'll go like this. So here's a few lessons that I've learned. I've turned a mess into a message and earned a return. I've turned scars into stars, live like avatars. No one can stop you if you believe in your heart. And this is your life. Go and own it. Never let the past infect your future for a moment. Never let a weakness destroy your greatness. It's time to profess. You're too blessed to be stressed. Bam, you could be everything you want to be. But never let the inner me mm, be your enemy. It's time to be better and not bitter. It's a choice to be a winner. And it's a choice to be a quitter. So if you've been knocked down or thought about suicide, get out of the shadows and hold your head high because this is your time and this is your sign. Get up and climb. You were born for this moment to shine. My name's Derek Clark, Rapping Dad. Thank you, Ray, for having me out on your podcast. Thank you so much for coming on, man. All your links are in the bio. And I'm glad I got to you before Joe Rogan did. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thanks, lad. <laughs>